Hi, I'm Sally Rosenthal. I'm the director and producer of American Masters Mae West Dirty Blonde. Thank you for watching my film tonight and I hope you enjoyed it. And huge thanks to PBS and the National Endowment for the Humanities for making the film possible. It's my great pleasure to be here with you this evening as 13 and the Brooklyn Historical Society commemorate National Women's Equality Day. I can't imagine a better way to celebrate than being here with you, joined in conversation by Dr. Rick Derocher, Director of Theater and Multimedia Performance at Lehman College, City University of New York, Alexis Grinnell, writer and co-founder of public relations firm, is it Pythia Media? Pythia Media. No, Pythia. Pythia, everybody. Um, and Claudia Roth Pierpont, writer at The New Yorker. Together we'll dig deeper into some of the themes of the film and explore the concept of Mae West as a feminist. We'll also answer as many of your questions as we can, so go ahead and type them into the OB chat. So I guess on that note to start, let's pick up where Natasha Leone left off at the end of the film. Would you describe Mae West as a feminist? Undeniably. Why? I think that there is a wrong answer here and there's <laughs> only one right answer. She's clearly a feminist and she's clearly in the way in which she had to invent herself she, I think, I, I'm, I think it may be Claudia who says in the film, but she doesn't come out of her own time. She's totally out of context for herself. In fact, it's crazy to think, you know, Mae West is born before women actually get the vote, which we're celebrating on this same day, the centennial um, of suffrage. So it's crazy to imagine that like Mae West is sauntering across the stage in 1933 and she'd done him wrong. Uh, eight years after women can legally vote for the first time in the United States and not all women, white women we're talking about, of course. So Alexis, uh, I have a, it's a interesting because uh, would you think she would see herself that way though? Well, she gets asked that question, right? And she sort of skirts around it a little bit in very right. Mae Westy style, uh, <laughs> because I think probably the kind of feminism, the first and second wave feminism Mae West lived through was very, pers uh, incorrectly characterized as anti-man and Mae West is all about men. So hmm. There's a way in which many of these outstanding early feminists didn't necessarily see themselves as representative and I think that may be where the little catch is that she saw herself as extraordinary in her own time. I think there's a quote that surprised me a bit in the documentary where she says like I have a little trouble talking to women. She's already very successful by then because I'm a producer, I'm a director. What do, what do I have in common? But it's what she meant to women that is, and, and the argument she made for all women that makes her so clearly such an important feminist figure, however you define it, and whatever she thought she meant by it, that, that women were her audience, yeah. that she spoke so clearly through, through sex, but for power and freedom and independence. And that was her argument. And that's what she meant underneath all the jewelry and the platinum blonde hair. I think women felt that so strongly about yeah. her. I was thinking about Lucille Ball in the same way, being a producer, writer, mm -hmm. director, actor, you know, uh, when you're at that level and you're doing all those jobs, it's hard not to see yourself as very powerful. And I think- right. that is exactly the word for all of these. As women. an unusual woman. In a way, yeah. But. Well, considering their forerunners in their craft and their mm -hmm. field well and they're in power. I was amazed, Sally. It reminded me, uh, I rewatched um, the, uh, the documentary last night and I, I was really stunned by the way that she was able to control the set in Hollywood when studios and moguls had so much power mm -hmm. over each even performers, especially performers, they were all under contract. You know, even Catherine Hepburn and these folks didn't have the kind of control that Mae West did. Right. Well, she was the only one, as far as I know, who had actually had her own production unit. Exactly. And she could choose all her people. I mean, I think she even chose background actors. It's it right. wasn't just the leading men. Exactly. It's interesting I like to look at the leading men over the course of her film career. They start out quite young, and then as she gets older, they catch up a little bit. <laughs> so it's not too much of a charity. But, um, but Claudia, something you said in the film about that she's got a message for you in the 1930s. Oh, yeah. Mm. Are, do people, are we there yet? Do people still need to <laughs> hear the message? 
Uh, I don't know if we're there yet. I think um, I, I, I thought of her a little through the Kavanaugh hearings, actually. I'm not sure we're there yet. There's that great line, and I know you paused to pick it up, and she'd done him wrong, but it goes by fast. And it's so important that it's when she's consoling that young woman in the, in the bar room who's tried to kill herself because of some married man. And I think in the original play, there was a suggestion that she was pregnant, which of course is gone in the movie. And it's actually based on fact because it was a bathroom where women committed suicide and some joint on the Bowery that was famous. And she says, men are all alike, married or single, it's their game. I just happen to be smart enough to play it their way. You'll come to it. And that you'll come to it to me is her speaking to all of us, you know, the generations down the line coming to it. Yeah, that's her promise, I think. I mean, I think the message is still so resonant. I have here behind me my, our modern day Mae West, Stormy Daniels, of who I'm a, I'm a big fan of hers. And, you know, Stormy Daniels, what's fascinating about her in this sort of Mae Westian way is that she is, you know, like West, she's essentially playing the whore in this way that is, you know, she's completely open about, completely blatant about, quite literally trades, has sex on camera. Um, and the kind of deluge of anti, of like horophobia that comes shooting at her from every corner that she shoots down with these one-liners on Twitter, sort of like, people are like, you're a whore. And she says, so, you know, it's lucrative. It's gotten me real far here. It, she's got all these zingers in the same way that, you know, Mae West is essentially playing the whore in not quite literally, but literally enough for the time. And then you see 20, you know, the 21st century and Stormy Daniels is a sort of modern type character taking the same kind of incoming, but she's also celebrated like West was as well. So to me, there are some really obvious parallels there. She also writes and directs and acts in her own film. She has a huge amount of ownership over herself and she refuses to be ashamed. And I think it's in, she done him wrong. She, Mae West also says, uh, no, no, it's not that. It's not she done. I forget which movie. She says, I, you know, it's, I, I used to feel ashamed. And someone says, well, what happened? She says, I stopped. Like I stopped. I just heard it. Yeah. <laughs> Hell, the 90s, I want to say, maybe. Yeah, I think that's right. Is it? But yeah, the way she um, portrays herself and women in general, the, the women that she supports, but especially herself as this figure of strength mm -hmm. um, in her movies. Yeah, I, mean, I also think that she doesn't... Oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, Rick, I was going to say this question for you, just the, oh, the difference yeah. between the women in the screwball comedies of the 1930s yeah. and her portrayal of womanhood in 1930s. Yeah, well, exactly. And, you know, uh, I, I've done a lot of research in this area, and I think it's very interesting because when the screwball comedy came into play, suddenly sexuality uh, on both sides, for men and women, was toned way down and it became sort of more like buddy movies and one-upmanship and being witty. And as Buster Keaton would say, Hollywood got in with all its playwrights with all their witty lines like Kaufman and Hart and all these folks. Um, and it became about the banter. Uh, and for Mae West, it's not about the banter, it's about her reaction to what's going on around her. And I was thinking at the end of My Little Chickadee, which I disagree, I, I actually like this movie uh, for a lot of reasons, but you know that uh, W.C. Fields and Mae West wrote their own material for themselves because they didn't trust anybody else or each other to be funny mm -hmm. enough uh, for them. But at the end of this movie, she has two guys, one who's supposedly a good guy, he's like the journal, I think it's the newspaper guy, you know, who's uh, exposing all the, all the wrongs in town. The other guy's like a gangster. But she basically says to both of them, I'll sleep with it. either of you, you know, either of you come see me whenever you want, but I'm not going to choose, you know what I mean? So she's basically saying, you know, I'll go in either direction. You would never get that from Catherine Hepburn or Carol Lombard or any of those folks. They are focused on the lead, you know, Cary Grant. Ironically, Cary Grant is in this first movie with her. Mm -hmm. um, Harry Grant would get all the sort of, you know, uh, witty banter and sort of go back and forth with these women. So I think it's a huge difference and she's in total control. And I was going to say in terms of like Stormy Daniels too, I think a major difference is, is that she sort of took the Gypsy Lo Rose Lee uh, way of, of uh, sort of seducing men which was not to show a lot of flesh and not to be overt in her sexuality 
But, you know, the costumes she wears are mostly like 19th century getups. And it was said in the documentary about how they were always elegant and well chosen. It wasn't trashy. And not that I'm saying Stormy Daniels is trashy. But I think uh, comparatively, I would say that Mae West is not as overt in, in sell, like actually having to do anything she doesn't want to do or say anything she doesn't want to say or even kiss or, or touch anybody she doesn't want to touch. Yeah, she but that's very clear. I have just, I, I want to push back on two things. One, yeah. you, you mentioned that she doesn't, she reacts to her environment, that she's sort of like light on the banter. And I just, I don't read it that way. To me, she's she's leading the banter and everybody is sort of following and catching up and usually having a moment of like, oh, did she say that? Like when she, you know, in My Little Chickadee, right? She walks out after being declared basically an un indecent woman. And the judge says like, oh, are you, are you, uh, are you, what does she say? Are, are, you, are you trying to be in contempt of this court? And she says, I'm barely hiding it basically. Right. To hide it. Yeah. But also the idea that she's not overt. I mean, her sexuality is dripping off of her. It's exactly as you say. She says at the end of My Little Chickadee, like, you know, I'm not going to choose because I'm going to have both. Right. And she says, you know, I'm going to have both of you. Yeah. And there's nothing that she doesn't control in that scenario. And she, that's the whole theme. She's in control the entire time. In the same way that, and I'm going to, again, because I'm such a Stormy Daniels fan too. Yeah, no, he yeah. isn't making any choices that aren't entirely hers either. Right. And I was thinking more that when I say that she's reacting, people are usually asking her questions and then she responds with a great one liner or puts them down and puts them in their place. And I think that's her power. You know, she doesn't have to make a big speech or, you know, say mm -hmm. a lot or, or like even start a conversation. It's more usually someone asks her something like like you just said in those two comments. Uh, and then she gives the one liner and knocks them out and they have nowhere to go after that. Like yeah. they're, they're out. So that in a way that, that I would agree with a hundred percent. Yeah. There's also the great preparations that are made for her entrances in these films. I don't know if that's something that we got to discuss in the documentary. She's so set up for her arrival. It's like the major arrival of a Broadway star in a production. And this, that long carriage ride where everybody's talking about how beautiful she is and how fantastic she is for a good 10 minutes before she shows up and you see her. And everything is prepared so that she is the center of everything. And no man in the film is going to be her equal. And I do think there was nobody like her. But there is a period, and, and I'm sure you know this very well, Rick, in the early 30s and 33, where Mae West happens and Catherine Hepburn happens. And you get this odd sense of a kind of wonderland of female possibility that nobody really knows what women might turn out to be if unleashed. Mm -hmm. and, they're, and the movies are sort of showing them to you and yet also trying to control them because Hepburn does have some control a little later on especially, but the same thing happens to her movies. She's married off in the end. Nobody remembers that half the time. You know, all the early melodramas where she's an airplane pilot, and she's all kind. Of, they put in quick marriages at the end in a way just because people don't seem to know yet how a really free woman's life would turn out right. if they let her live it through to the end. So they just plopped on a conventional ending, which is also considered audience saving. But there was this moment and West is at the, the forefront of that. And the documentary mentions Shirley Temple, which is another crazy example, but, and even Dietrich in her way, this is not a human being by any standards. She's an artificial, creation of some astonishing kind and it's as though the country were experimenting with what they thought a woman might be before everybody got too afraid and clamped down and the rules got too hard. I think that's interesting what you're saying about Katherine Hepburn because I was thinking about Philadelphia's story in the yeah. same sort of vein where she has two lovers essentially or I guess an ex-husband and a, a current potential lover and you know again she it's quite clear she's been with both uh, mm -hmm. doesn't want to choose between them. And mm -hmm. yes, she ends up in this marriage back to her former husband because it's a comedy. It needs to end this way. Uh, and Jimmy Stewart needs to go back to his girlfriend, basically. Right. But what's interesting is it's a good guy and a sort of bad guy. You know, mm -hmm. the bad guy now is Cary Grant and the good guy is uh, Jimmy Stewart. But it's the same. She wants them both. And, I, and so does Mae West. In, in, and that's uh, also in, a property in with... Movie, I'm sorry. I, 
Yeah, she no. certainly didn't write that property, but it was written for her. She bought it for herself. She chose the director. She chose, you know, the actors. So there was a lot of control going on behind the scenes, even if there, even if helpless femininity is, was presented in front of the camera sometimes. Yeah, absolutely. Hmm. And, you know, maybe said in her autobiography that she became aware at a very early age that there was a double standard for men and women when it right. came yeah. how much fun you're allowed to have. And mm -hmm. uh, I'm curious, especially um, Claudia, how you see her address this double standard on screen in the, in the movies. Well, it's uh, that, that line I mentioned before and, and she'd done them wrong. It's, it's right there in front of you. What's interesting to me in a way, and the documentary did touch on this, is how angry she is about this fact in her early career. And these scripts have been published, Sex and Pleasure Man and the Drag. And she's not kidding around. She is talking about this double standard and she's not making jokes about it. There are no diamonds and there are no plumes and there are no double entendres. She's a prostitute and she's angry and she hates men and she makes no bones about it. There are lines that are more like, uh, ever since I knew about sex, I've regarded men as hunters. I mean, people hear the sex and they think, oh, it was a farce on Broadway, but it wasn't a farce. She was furious. This was something that meant something to her. Mm -hmm. And then she manages to make, to make it funny so that everybody can swallow it. There's a lot of sugar added in, but it's still, it's still there. The way she stands up for women throughout in these movies, again, that line to that young woman and she done it wrong. It spells it all out. It's I their game. It's, it's their brilliant. game. You it's have to learn how to play it. She, it's interesting she calls a play sex just to sell tickets, frankly. Not yeah. because that's what a good title for the play necessarily, but I right. absolutely agree with you, Claudia, because this is something um, that folks don't think she's serious about. When she wrote Pleasure Man and the drag, for example, she's not even in these plays. Right. You know, she's writing them as, as you know, exposés or not even exposés, but as just what's around her, who she's with, the folks that she performs with backstage, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and also the vulnerability of homosexual men and uh, young women, uh, you know, doing tours, going around the country, doing vaudeville, doing, you know, regular theater. Uh, but they're very vulnerable, uh, especially to men and producers, and they could be left in any town and fired instantaneously if they didn't put up with, you know, the boss, basically. Mm -hmm. So it's it, she's really standing up for these folks and giving them jobs on top of it all. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we didn't have a chance to get into this in the film, but, you know, the drag gets closed down before it's ever opened, and she's sort of warned never to do this again. And not just because of that film, but partly a law is passed that um, prohibits the open depiction of homosexuality on stage after that. So then she comes out with Pleasure Man, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> which right. I think she actually did get arrested for, if I'm remembering correctly. Right. I think it had two performances and that was it. But the fact that these plays got produced and actually got on stage, no matter how mm -hmm. successful they were or not, is sort of stunning, especially in the 1920s. Women as playwrights of any kind were rare. You know, Sophie Treadwell and a couple other folks were sort of there. Um, but but to, to talk about women in control, as we've been talking about, and also, like I say, she's, she's writing these roles for all these folks. So we can critique her playwriting skills, you know, which I'm not interested in at all. But I, I do believe that um, she's very sincere and really wants us to believe these characters as three-dimensional people. Now, whether she's successful at that is why playwriting is so difficult. Right. But, you know. I, Later I, on, she said, for what it's worth, she she wanted to, to have those plays looked at as something, as Ibsen's plays were looked at, yeah. as ex explorations of sexual mores way in advance of their time, things like ghosts. Right. But I, I mean, in the, interesting, yeah. the, this, to the question about how she was even able to exist, I mean, she's she's only able to exist in this sort of hyper parody form too, right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, this idea of, she can write about sexual mores as as the, the kind of horror character, right? She's, the, she's both in control and she's, this hyper, you know, annualized kind of version of the, of, she's the joke too. She's in control and she's pulling the joke at the same time. Mm -hmm. Because it is, it's, it's inconceivable. I mean, we've always had this character of the kind of the whore throughout literature and history right. who, has, who has a special place. Like the whore is a truth teller. She is uniquely powerful. She's mm -hmm. disdained by women and she's 
lusted after by men, but also not publicly, just privately in the kind of, in her boudoir. You can't proclaim your love for the whore in the same way that like Catherine Hepburn and Joan Crawford, they don't play whores. They're, they're very pretty women who are the desirable women. You want to show up to other people. And Mae West even says this at some point. She's like, I knew I wasn't the most beautiful woman. Right. So she kind of finds her niche and in a way has this voice because she can own the whore character, play it up so grandly as to kind of be her own running joke. It's this, it's an incredible kind of dance to me because I watched this and it's really in the modern era, it seems like it must've seemed, I can't understand, I can't imagine how somebody would have seen it in like the thirties and forties, but right now it's like such a huge parody to watch her. And in part, because I feel like I've seen so many Mae West parodies. Uh -huh. That's probably why. <laughs> you know, but but even someone like, you know, I was thinking in um, after rewatching My Little Chickadee, the character's name is Flower Bell Lee. Lee right. And, you know, what is it? 20 years later, Gentlemen Who For Blondes comes out and Marilyn Monroe's character is Lorelai Lee. Right. Mm -hmm. And in that movie, she plays a, a in, in, in the, like, she's not the super knowing sexual, you know, being, but she's the ingenue. It's working a lot of men kind of quietly to herself. And I felt like that was a little bit of an homage, but that's also how the ability of the whore to, to be seen publicly develops. Where in the Marilyn Monroe character, she's never oozing sexuality knowingly, it's unknowingly. Mm -hmm. There's something about this tradition, this whore in literature and in drama, you may know more about than I do, because what she doesn't have deliberately and by design is any vul of the vulnerability that that implies to me. She's at nobody. She's being bought by nobody. She's still in control. And what we see is her bedecked with all the, the loot that she's got from this. And she seems to be able to pick and choose men whom she finds desirable. And at no point do we ever see her subject to being chosen against her will or having to turn a dollar or anything that would suggests tragedy or darkness or victimization. So while you can characterize her as a poor, it's something else because of the comedy and because, because she's uplifted the entire position so that she is firmly in charge. And I don't know how that fits in with this whole tradition. Well, I mean, well, I think, go ahead, Rick. Oh, I was just gonna say, because you had mentioned uh, earlier, Claudia Ibsen, and I thought I had a gabbler uh, actually. Because Hedda is yeah. also the same way. She's she's very there's no vulnerability. It's all about being a man in a in a or, or appearing to have men's qualities, shall we say, in, in a man's yeah. world. But I know, but um, but she's her own person and she's still a woman and very sexual and very sensual because Hedda Gabler, you know, has Loveborg and she's in total control of that relationship. She's having an affair with one guy. She has a husband who's obviously asexual at, at best. And, uh, you know, but she's stuck around. And then she has this guy, this monster, this Trump-esque monster in, uh, in the judge that is constantly pawing at her. And it reminds me a lot of Mae West and having these men that are, I see the men in these movies, by the way, as being the sort of two-dimensional characters. They the are. women are three-dimensional because even the girls that she's working with, like in She Done Him Wrong, the girls that come in to work for her, mm -hmm. and she's basically the madam of this of this place, um, they're not vulnerable either. They're they're pretty tough. And just as uh, Sally points out in the documentary, you know, right at the beginning, um, she's known as a tough girl, meaning just that. And she grew up in Greenpoint, Brooklyn, and we and she has that Brooklyn accent. And I, you know, I, I've lived in Brooklyn almost my whole life. We still have these people here, <laughs> and they're not taking any crap, and they don't care about class or you know the fact that they're women or they're unattractive. You know, traditionally speaking, you know, they, they make their way because it's the only thing they have. You know, and and they make best use of it. And so I see the men in these things to be like the muscle men that are in all those later movies and stage mm. shows in Vegas. I mean, they're ridiculous and they look yeah. ridiculous. She actually looks, you know, I, I think it's funny people think that because she's older, it looks pathetic. I actually think they look pathetic in relationship to her and she looks mm. great. Ah. She, what is she doing wrong? Nothing. <laughs> she looks fabulous. She's 70 years old and She's got men fawning all over her. How bad is this? Yeah. <laughs> I agree with you on that very much. Yeah.
Well, you know, it's funny. That's something we asked every single person we interviewed, you know, what do you think of what she does when she gets older? And people had such different responses to it. Mm. It's pathetic. It's empowering. It doesn't work because older women don't want to see themselves that way. It doesn't work because younger women don't want to see what they're going to become. And uh, as the one person I haven't asked yet, um, Alexis, what, what do you think? What does it say about our society that we're so uncomfortable with a sexualized older woman? You know, the funny thing is when I, it's such a funny question because it's not just that she has sex, but she has pleasure, right? right? That's what's so intimidating about Mae West because sex is one thing, but she's just so open about her pursuit of pleasure, about desire. And I think that that on its face is we're always uncomfortable with in American society, no matter how old or young you are. And she's sort of unapologetic about desiring men, about desiring pleasure. And, you know, it's interesting because she says in the documentary, right, you, you know, like she doesn't drink, she doesn't smoke. She's not like, I want to go out and party to her. A party is like going to a boxing match. Um, she's not, she, th th this idea of, um, I guess what we think of as like the sort of the trappings of sex of like getting drunk and smoking and partying and have a good time. Like she's not interested. That's not where her pleasure is. And she has a very particular understanding of what her own pleasure is. I think that's what's really intrinsically intimidating about that whole concept of her aging with that idea. It was intimidating when she was younger and it was intimidating when she was older. And she's unrestrained about accepting herself and her own, on her own terms. And so with Sex Tent, you have these, you know, younger male suitors who are just showing up and it's just proof that she's enjoyed herself. I think that's the sin, right? Because you can be an older woman, but it's, and you can be grand and you can be graceful and you can certainly be married. Um, but the idea that you've lived and loved and enjoyed it all, it's just actually, it's just not very American. It's just not very Anglo. I think that's an idea we had see much more, you know, accepted certainly in Latin societies where the, you know, your your first sex is actually it's typically for a, a boys with an older woman. Right. And that's considered a rite of passage. That's an important part of your development. You're lucky that an older woman takes you into manhood. So, you know, an older woman as being undesirable or, or intimidating is really a very Anglo idea. Yeah, and she's a uh, you know a child of immigrants, so she's not really Anglo at all. I mean, she uh, Irish and German, right? So, uh, and living in Greenpoint, you know, she is, but also working class. That makes a huge difference in terms of how she perceives herself. And you know, I think that that's exactly right. Uh, having that background, she's not a wasp. <laughs> she's not Anglo American in that way, and she doesn't behave by those rules clearly. Yeah, but I wouldn't give, I wouldn't say that being like the child of German immigrants puts her particularly in a sex forward position. I mean, as we're talking about the culture of Martin Luther and I think she's, she is unique for her context and her, for her religious background. I just mean in the continuum of how we see female sexuality, particularly older women, hmm. I would say in Northern European cultures, the idea of women's pleasure is generally intimidating in the way where Latin cultures understand older women as the keepers of manhood. I think it depends on what you mean by older also. Right. Um, when she comes to the screen, she's in her 40s. And there's this, there's a lot of wonderful movie criticism by Colette, actually, who adored Mae West. And Colette is, I think, in her 60s by then. And of course, she's created Cherie, and she's played Leia on the stage. She's played a whore who loses her young lover because of age because she's probably entered her late 40s or 50s when she loses Cherie, and that's what it's all about. And it's heartbreaking. That's what the two books are about, Cherie and the Last of Cherie. And she loves Mae West. And she's looking at Mae West as an older woman. Mae West is now probably all of 45 mm -hmm. when Colette is writing about her. Colette's 20 years older. And she says, oh, I love her. She, of all movie heroines, does not have to get married at the end of the movie does not have to go off into exile, does not die, and most of all, and I forget the line exactly, but, but does not sit there looking into a mirror, sad and miserable at having lost her beauty and no longer being desirable. She does not know the afflictions that older women endure. And that's what she sees in Mae West at 45. And that's Colette, a great you know, woman of the world who epitomizes, I think, what we think of as a woman of the world, who had many younger lovers herself in her 60s. But then what happens? 45 is one thing. 
and 55 and she's 60 when she goes goes to Las Vegas and I agree the men are the, uh, the the crazy thing about that and then she's 70 and then she's 80 so what is an 80 year old woman supposed to be right. and in a strange way I think this is really the last taboo this we were we can all deal with everything else about Mae West I don't think we can deal with this Although I would say it's really beautiful the relationship she has with that young younger man I forget his name sorry um, you know the bodybuilder that was in her show that really touched me in a way that I wasn't expecting because that seems to be a real love relationship regardless of you know it being a sexual one or not I have no idea it's not really matter but obviously they loved each other and really cared for each other and um, I didn't have this feeling of like oh that's weird why would you know because my brain just went to, you know, Clint Eastwood has like a 30 year old wife, you know, or whatever. It's, mm -hmm. it's pretty common with men. We know that. But in her case, since she's always been in that place and always presented herself that way, I just accepted it like this is beautiful. It makes perfect sense that she would fall in love or at least feel, you know, warmly toward uh, this young guy uh, who obviously felt the same way about her and it had nothing to do with their looks. I don't think for either of them personally yeah. or age. You know, one thing I just wanted to, to touch base on this because I was reading through the interviews of the, there are so many great things in the interviews that we just couldn't use in the film because of time. And, uh, and Claudia had said that every feminist is a transitional figure. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I found myself thinking about in what ways was May a transitional figure if she was. What did she bridge? I love that idea, learning to say. I think it's it's so intrinsically true. Because we're never there, is that what you mean, Alexis? Well, no, just because it's essentially like the idea that every feminist is a transitional figure in the way that you're, you're pu always pushing this envelope for your time. It's the... Mm -hmm. So to, in, in some ways, something I thought about to just answer the question is maybe, you know, Mae West is existing so far ahead of the legal um, mm -hmm. rights of women at the time she's living. You know, mm -hmm. she, she's making insane amounts of money. She's controlling her work and her ownership of that work. And she's able to make financial and economic decisions that are simply not available to women without, I mean, women are wards of their husband at this time in every sense of the I, we're, right. world. So to me, that's the, she's so discordant with the legal reality of what it means to be a woman in, in her, in her time. Mm -hmm. I thought of like, uh, you know, uh, Queen Elizabeth I, who never got married to keep power and May, uh, May West is doing the same thing, basically. She's like, ah. well, if I get married, I'll lose all my power instantaneously. Yeah. Right, the reverse, right? Because Elizabeth I is the virgin queen. Her power. <laughs> <laughs> not really. <laughs> It's different, but it's, it's similar. I, I see like the parallel. No, Queen Elizabeth was having plenty of sex with everybody in her court. It was that, it was that, uh, uh, that she, um, she, uh, they advertised her as the Virgin Queen as a divine to keep her in that position. Cause if they had found out about her relationships, just like with Mae West, she would have been, you know, I'm sure she would have been thrown oh, in jail. I'm, I'm well aware, but the, but the idea that she, her power was also in never getting married and being a presumed virgin versus Mae West, who's never getting married and being a presumed and flagrant whore, essentially, and not, not in my concept of a whore. Would you be disappointed, Alexis, as a young feminist, if it were suddenly revealed that Mae West had one single 20 year relationship and it all wasn't real. Would that disappoint oh, you? He, but she does, right? She has this. this well, I don't know. She, I, doubt that, actually. I doubt that that was it. But if, but would it disappoint you as a young no. feminist? No, no, because I, you know, I think it's an interesting question because it goes to that parody thing, right? Like I want her to be a person. And if her and if her person is like, yeah, for me this is my guy, but I my my, con, my my parody is that I can I can have whomever and however many I I want, but what I want is this one guy. Mm. She's allowed that, you know, personal versus parody. I mean, she says she was schooled out of it by her mother at a really young mm -hmm. age right. to get where she got, and that is the reason for. Yeah, it. I, I would agree with that because it's about it's you know. I have to say, being in performing arts my whole life, we all do this. We all sort of push 
personal relationships to the side in order to do our work sometimes. And some of us, myself included, would uh, uh, have to do it because, you know, you're always working, you're always somewhere around the world. I mean, she's a huge Hollywood star on top of it all. Everybody wants a piece of her. Um, you don't have a lot of time to devote to somebody, even if you wanted to. And I think her mother is absolutely right. And I think her working class background also reinforces that because she's not getting married anytime soon, even if she wanted to, because right. she's already, you know, tainted goods in the time period. You know, no one, no respectable. Well, you, you know, that's true, though. No respectable man is going to marry Mae West. There might be some desperate characters that want her money or her power, and there were, uh, but no respectable guy because she's already painted this way, uh, and and it's not going to happen. Nor does she want it. So I think nor it's does she tempted. want it? Yeah. Huh? Plus, she's too old. You know, I think well, that, in those yep, days, you're over, you know, twenty twenty five, and that's yeah, it's it. true. <laughs> You know, it's interesting because all those guys like uh, in that time that came from vaudeville were all in their 40s when they went to Hollywood, including Mae West was in her late 30s and uh, 40. And even, you know, today that's impossible to do. Uh, the fact that they pulled that off and that she pulled that off is unbelievable. Um, so we're running a little tight on time. I just wanted to quickly address a couple of the, um, the audience questions we got specifically is there a book about Mae West you would recommend? I'm gonna answer this one. Um, yeah. I would say read Claudia's article in the New Yorker. Oh, um, thank you. It's I, in a book, Passionate Minds. Don't go to the New Yorker. <laughs> Buy the book. Yes, <laughs> find the book on Amazon, I did. And uh, and it's, it's just fantastic and really thoughtful and in depth. As far as a biography goes, I would say Jill Watts, um, Mae West, a, an icon in black and white was excellent. Um, Mary Beth Hamilton's book was excellent. That's great. And uh, yeah. yeah, and um, and Rick has a book where he makes a connection between May and Tina Fey, which is something. <laughs> a shameless uh, promotion. Thanks, Sally, for bringing that up. Well, how do you make the connection from May to Tina Fey? What's the through line? Uh, well, it's it's what I was saying earlier in the fact that she does it all, right? Tina Fey was the first head writer on Saturday Night Live female ever, and still is, by the way. <laughs> uh, she's not working there anymore, obviously, but, um, you know, there hasn't been. She hasn't been replaced by another woman. Uh, and, of course, she's a producer. She's an actor. When you look at her shows, 30 Rock, Kimmy Schmidt, all these things, she's in them. She, they're comedies. She's in them. They're also all, I think, all the Tina Fey shows are about a single woman who is unmarried, who's a career woman. Uh, and the difference is with Tina Fey, she plays sort of the dowdy, unsexual or undesirable woman. Ironically, she's, you know, fairly attractive, I would say, or very attractive. Mae West is doing the opposite. She's like, well, I may not be a great beauty, but, you know, sex sells and I can do that. And, uh, so I think they're both using uh, 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 that in a, in a great way. And also the, uh, they're both feminists from that point of view too. They are forerunners, again, transitional folks who changed the face of television, film, and the stage. Uh, and remember too that Tina Fey um, was a uh, improv, you know, what I would call vaudeville, you know, second city performer where they do short sketches, comedy sketches. So this is vaudeville. Right. This is the kind or songs. And this is the kind of thing Mae West used to do uh, on stage and sort of cobbled them together into loose stories in order to get to her song, to get to her comedy bit. So I would say they're doing something very similar. And also they're both produced like Lucille Ball is the connector for me in the 50s, um, you know, as a producer, writer, director, actor. Um, so one last question, because we're over time and I wish we could keep going, but um, we're being nudged, is a question for all of you. What aspects of Mae West should women today claim for themselves? Freedom, the decision, the desire to do what you want, to not be subject to the will of other people in the major choices you make in your life. And I don't think it's about sex. Sex was the way she said that. Sex was her tool for saying that. Sex was what she was given. I think we could talk about Tina Fey. I think we could talk about Ruth Bader Ginsburg in terms of lessons that Mae West has given us for who we can become 
and for not letting men rule your life. And I would say, you know, uh, for, for performers of any kind, male, female, just what Claudia says here is really important to make your own choices, to not be forced into doing things or stereotyped in a way that you don't want to be. Uh, and Mae West sets the tone for that, especially for young women to say, no, I don't have to go down that road. I can make whatever choice I want. And it's not going to be easy. Like, you know what I mean? Like it, that to me is what's so great about her is it, it she, you know, it's not going to be easy, but do it. Otherwise you will feel like you've wasted your life. And I think that's the legacy. Not to let a man get the last word. I know. I was, I was <laughs> before you did, Alex. <laughs> Please. Yes. And to quote May, she said, I never said it would be easy. I only said it would be worth it. Ah, right. oh, that's very true. And I wish we could keep going, but that is all the time we have for tonight. And Claudia, thank you, Lewis, Sally. And Rick, thank you all so much for being here. With thank us. you for making a wonderful film, Sally. Yeah, it's truly, truly really lovely. wonderful. Well, on behalf of me and 13 and the Brooklyn Historical Society, just want to Thank our audience for joining us, and I hope you will come up and see us again sometime. <laughs>